tonight we are going to be talking about crop rotation because somebody asked me to talk about that so that's what we're gonna do let me move my screen around a little bit so i can see what's going on okay so uh crop rotation is the is the subject tonight uh there's pretty so there's some pretty awesome things about crop rotation first of all what I want to say about crop rotation is as we, as we begin to create functioning soils, crop rotation is becoming a thing of the past. Now in the old days, meaning yesterday or 10 years ago or a thousand years ago, I don't really know what I mean by the old days, but if you don't have a functioning soil, then you need to rotate your crops. And the reason people would rotate crops and the reason it became a normal part of agriculture is because if you didn't rotate your crops, your crops would develop disease and pests. So we had, uh, you know, so if you grew green beans, like every, um, I don't know, every, every year for say 10 years. By the end of 10 years, growing green beans in the same soil over and over again, they would start bad, um, bad problems would start happening to the green beans. There's a lot of different diseases. Depending on your location in the world where you are, the disease and pests would be different in something like green beans or in potatoes. We've all heard in history of the Irish potato famine. Well, that is caused or was caused because of a, a disease. It was blight that wiped them out. And farmers found that if we would rotate crops and we would spend time, like maybe two or five years without a certain plant family in a field, then the crops would do better. They wouldn't get the same pests. They wouldn't get the same diseases that they normally get if we put the plants in the same place um, year after year. So, uh, so crop rotation is really very important if you don't have a uh, recording in soil. But you really need to have the functioning soil uh, for a lot of reasons, and every week we're talking about this, and so you already know a lot of the reasons of why. But for tonight's presentation here, I'm just going to say that crop rotation is a thing of the past as far as um, like having a functioning soil, meaning if your soil is really awesome, you don't have to have crop rotation anymore. And there will be people who hear this that say I'm absolutely nuts. And that is because crop rotation is standard. It is as standard as plowing. It's as, as standard as tillage. It is as standard as a good integrated pest and disease management idea. Um, there's a dozen things we do in agriculture, all of them are becoming a thing of the past because we are learning how to mimic nature and we are implementing what we learn from nature into our agricultural systems. So things are just working the way it was designed by Heavenly Father and so we don't need to do all of the hard work that we have done in the past to grow food. So I could be done right now with our presentation on crop rotation, but people always hate it when I end too quick. But I really don't know what else to tell you. So let me just reiterate what I already said. First of all, if you are doing tillage, if you're using chemical man-made fertilizers, if you are using pesticides, and herbicides, you better have a good crop rotation program because you're going to have soil that does not infiltrate water well when it rains or when you irrigate. You will have soil that does not 
um, function properly, the microbial life will not be there. Your soil will most likely be compacted. And in those conditions, crop rotation is imperative to grow good crops. But if you have a soil that is functioning very well, you can grow the same crop in that soil year after year after year after year, and the crops do just fine. I have acquaintances and colleagues around the world who have been proving this for a long time. Uh, my friend Charles Dowding from England, he is showing that uh, crop rotation truly is becoming a thing of the past when you have good, um, you know, a good functioning soil. So what we need to do, let's just go to the next slide here real quick. Um, let me see, I pulled a couple of slides here. Let's see which one I want to talk about. Let's go to this one right here. Let's review quickly what a functioning soil actually is. So a functioning soil, it'll hold water and nutrients like a sponge. The roots penetrate without obstructions. What this means is the roots will penetrate six feet, eight feet, 20 feet deep, depending on the species because different species have different depths of roots. The sad thing is in most soils, most agricultural soils, you take a penetrometer out there and you stick it in the ground. This is a tool I use all the time. And it goes in one to five inches and we're hitting 300 PSI at one to five inches. Purdue University shows us that they've done a lot of demonstrations and they have shown that roots will not penetrate over 300 PSI, um, soil compaction that's that bad. So, I mean, what are you gonna do? You know, if, if your roots won't grow, then the roots have to grow horizontal. And when they're growing horizontal, you need more water because they can't get down into the water that's way down in the ground. And when the plant is that stressed, it's going to be susceptible to diseases and other problems. And when that happens, you can't hardly grow crops. And so the answer to that over the years has been till it up, use a deep ripper, um, do something to break up that compaction. And for one season, that usually fixes the problem, but then you have to till every year, and then that creates a whole host of other problems. And so crop rotation has become standard practice because of stressed plants, and stressed plants get sick. Uh, stressed plants get um, cleaned up by um, insects. We call them pests, but they're really just the ecological cleanup crew to clean up things that are not healthy. A functioning soil, it's full of the beneficial microbes and the microbes mineralize the sand, silts and clays. And they, so they make the fertilizer for the plant so we don't have to add any of that stuff. Um, functioning soils do not erode. Let's say you got a 20 inch rain and your soil was able to infiltrate 10 inches, which is a lot of rain, but the other 10 inches ran off. Well, in a functioning soil, the, the water that's running off into the ditch or into the roadway or into the lake, that water will be crystal clear. And if you go out there in your field and you, the water is muddy that's running off, then that is an indicator that your soil is not functioning. And sometimes I get this argument from people and they will say, well, my soil is great and it was muddy. Well, that just shows me that the person saying that really does not understand the function of a very healthy soil because healthy soils do not erode. Um, there's lots of carbon in a functioning soil. The functioning soil feeds the plants. The functioning soil, it keeps the plants healthy. There is very low disease and pest pressure and plants grow to their genetic capacity. And in a functioning environment where the soil is functioning, you can hear the environment. You should be hearing birds, bees, bugs out there. So I, we've already gone over this si slide in other, uh, in other classes previously, but I wanted to go over it again tonight talking about the uh, crop rotation because Crop rotation is, is, 
it's not really needed and it makes it a lot easier to grow plants. So people will say, yeah, but if I grow tomatoes in the same spot every year, they get diseased. Yes, 99.9999% of gardens today, you still need to rotate your crops because your soil is not functioning yet because uh, you know, building a garden to have a functioning soil is not part of our culture yet. Um, these are new ideas. Now, some people have been doing this for hundreds of years. Some people have been doing this for decades. There are popular gardeners who've been promoting this type of thing for a decade or two. And uh, there's YouTubes out there and you can watch them and people say, ooh, oh, they have a beautiful garden. And then we go home and we continue to till and to add in things that cause compaction and things which kill our beneficial microbiota in the soil. So, you know, what are we actually managing? What are we managing to have this kind of a healthy soil so that we don't need to rotate crops? And how do we actually manage it? Well, we're managing plants. Now, a lot of people think that, uh, like, let's take a cattle rancher. If you're a cattle rancher or you know a cattle rancher, let's say you're a dairyman. Here again, it's cattle. Let's say you have a herd of sheep and you and that is your business. You are a plant manager, not a livestock manager. And when I talk to people about plants, I say you are a microbe manager, not a plant manager. But we still we still actually manage the plants. It's hard to manage the microbes. So the real answer here is microbe management. But we, it's hard to see the microbes. It's hard to know if they're there. But it's very easy and very simple to see and understand the plants that are there. So it's easy to manage plants because we can walk out there. And with simple observation, we can see what plants are growing. And with a little bit of education, we can know what plant families these plants are in. Nowadays, we have cell phones and we can get it apps. There's, I don't know how many apps there are, but there's probably dozens of them that will identify plants for us. I have one downloaded on my phone, but I haven't even used it yet. I've had it for a couple of months because I wanted to try it. But I don't use it because when I go out there, I just I know what most of the plants are. And so I haven't needed to use it. But for people who don't know what plants are, just get an app and it will tell you what the species is and what family it belongs to. And then we can know that if we have four, four is the magic number. So remember four, four, four. Four is the magic number. If you have four different plant families present growing at the same time in your garden, close enough together that the roots are mingling, you're gonna have exceptionally healthy plants. You will have disease, maybe not disease free, but you won't have um, disease disasters. Disease will not destroy a crop that you're growing. Pests will not destroy a crop. Will, <clears throat> will you have pest species in your garden? Sure, you want those species. The more complex of life that you have in your garden, the better your garden will be. If we destroy all of the aphids, then we destroy, then we have removed a major food source for a lot of the predators. And then the predators go somewhere else. And then when an aphid does take off, there's no predator there. But I have a pretty good population of aphids in my greenhouse right now, but I have absolutely no problem with any of my crops. A couple of weekends ago, we went out there and we were looking for aphids. We couldn't hardly find one, which is wonderful because you don't want your crops to be covered with aphids. Um, but anyway, we, so I encourage all life in my garden. And because I encourage all life, then I have a good predator prey relationship so that nature manages itself. And that's where we wanna to get to in our food producing. So as far as our subject tonight, what does this have to do with crop rotation? We want to rotate a little bit in our gardens, but not much. Focus on your roots. Think about your roots. Um, a carrot is a taproot. A parsnip is a taproot. 
um, salsify is a tap root. Uh, most clovers are tap roots. Radishes are tap roots. Let me think. What else? Um, rutabagas, turnips. Those are tap roots. What are some other tap roots? Um, did I say radishes? Uh, like the daikons are huge tap roots, but all radishes have a tap root. So we want to divide all plants into two groups: the tap roots and the fibrous roots. And we're not going to get any more complicated than that. So what would a fibrous root be that could be in your garden? Okay, any of the cereal grains, any of those grasses would be fibrous roots. Tomato would be a fibrous root. Uh, like onions and garlic, those would be fibrous roots. They don't have a big tap root going down. Uh, so if you can think of what the roots look like when you harvest crops, then you want to be mingling those crops together and growing at the same time. So instead of saying this year in this plot of land, I'm growing to grow carrots. So that's a tap root. Next year, I'm growing to grow lettuce because that's a fibrous root. Okay, that is not the way to do it. That is the old fashioned way of crop rotation. We want to get away from that kind of thinking. What we want to do is think, okay, let's list a couple of tap roots and then let's list a couple of fibrous roots. So we've got, um, we've got, let's just say radishes because somebody in our community loves radishes. So we're going to grow a bunch and then carrots because everybody loves carrots and then lettuce. Everybody needs lettuce. And what's another one? Tomatoes. Tomatoes would be a fibrous root. So now we have four plants but are they in the same family? Let's think, what did we say? Lettuce, um, carrots, those are unrelated. Tomatoes are unrelated by family. And what was the other one we said, Rad radish? I forgot what I was saying, um, but those are unrelated. Now, what if you had cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, those are all the same family. In fact, they're more closely related to that because they're all the same species. They're simply different varieties that have been bred to do different things. So it wouldn't work to say you were having different plant families growing together. Now, instead of growing these in separate places, grow them together at the same time. Now, sometimes it's hard to grow four edible plants in the same land at the same time. But a lot of times I can grow two really easy and still have good efficiency. Like right now I have strawberries and garlic growing together. So that's two completely unrelated plant families. They're growing together right now at the same time. So I need to have two more plant families, right? Yes, you do. So guess what I do? I let a few weeds grow. I let a few weeds grow sporadically and then I manage those weeds by not letting them go to seed. So as soon as one of those puts up a, it starts getting tall and skinny and it's putting out seeds, I will either cut it off so it can grow back again from the bottom, or I just remove the whole thing. But what's happening is we're getting diversity. We want lots of diversity, 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 diversity. And when we get all that amazing diversity, Nature takes care of itself and gardening becomes easy. So let's look at a picture here. So uh, here's a picture. So that's me and my daughter. <laughs> and let's count some plant families in here. So we have the brassica family. So we, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor right here, but this is a cabbage. See, it has that pointed leaf. This is a cabbage, it's called Felder Kraut cabbage. We grew those last year. So here's one, two, three, four. So there's four of those right there. And then over here, these big long oval leaves, these are with the white vein in the middle. These are cauliflower plants. Now the Felder Kraut cabbage and this snowball cauliflower those are the same species. So all of these great big broadleaf brassica plants 
And over here, right in front of our knees right there, that's broccoli. So all of those are brassica. So that is one plant family. But look what I have growing lower. If you go over here, see this red top here? This is, uh, those are, what the heck are those? I'm thinking those, I don't remember because this was last year, but from this picture, it looks like those are lettuce. Because I do, do grow a lot of different colors of lettuce. And then right here, there's a whole bunch of lettuce right in here. And do you see the weeds? So right here is a blade of grass coming up. Now, there's a lot of gardeners who would come into my garden and they would cringe and they would think, oh my goodness, why in the world does this guy think he's a gardener? There were weeds everywhere. Well, I guarantee you every weed in my garden is there by design and I like them because they don't take up very much space and they don't crowd out my other plants. Now, if I have a bazillion weeds in there, sure, they'll crowd them out. But look right here where my cursor is on this screen. I have one grass plant right here. And then let's move over. I have another one right here. And now let's move again. I have another one right here. And then I have this one right here. That's not crowding anything. If anything's crowding, it's my edible crops that are crowding out the weeds. But if you look, these plants are maybe 18 inches apart. Well, the root systems are certainly mingling with each other. So, uh, let, so we have grass. Let's assume that that grass is one plant family, okay? There are different families of, of grass, but let's just assume that this is one plant family. So that's one, the brassica is two, the lettuce is three. So look at the very bottom of the screen. I'm circling this lamb's quarters right here. So there is four. Lamb's quarters is my friend. It's small. I mean, it can get huge, but I don't let it because I manage it. So it's small. It doesn't crowd out my crops. It goes to seed quickly and it stays small and slender. But when it goes to seed, it gets really tall, like two to three feet tall. And I pull it out as soon as I see that happening. The root system is shallow and it's super easy to pull. So when I need to pull it, it pulls simply. So it's easy. So there, right there, just in this photo, and when we took this photo, I had no idea I would ever be able to use it for this class tonight. But it was just fun because I just thought, I thought, man, I should take some pictures. And then I just started scrolling through the slides I already had in here. And I thought, oh yeah, there's, there's like six plant families right here. Because if you look at the other side of the greenhouse, there's a whole bunch of other plant families growing over there. But those plant families are 20 or 30 feet away. So are those good roots going to mingle with these ones? No, they're not. But right here where these roots are mingling, we have at least four plant families. We, if we went out there, like if we went in the greenhouse right now and we looked straight down so we could actually see what's in this jungle, there's probably six or seven plant families and there's probably 20 species growing in a in this you know in this hundred square feet right here in front of me and my daughter in this photo and so this is how i do crop rotation i do crop rotation simultaneously in the moment when everything is growing at the same time crop rotation should not be what do i do this year and next year and i have a 10-year plan of a crop rotation that is old information that is outdated information that is not how you want to be growing food there are people smarter than me that have told me that nutritional tests on food grown this way will be at the top of the charts nutritionally where food grown in a monocrop with just one species, it struggles to have nutrition. So if a plant does not have good nutrition, then the bugs eat it up because the ecological role, let me say that correctly, an ecolo, oh dear. The ecological role of a pest is to clean up something that is dying. And so when we have a monocrop 
and we have none of the mineralizing bacteria and fungus in the soil, the plants bear, are barely alive. They might look pretty good to, to us, but once we do start doing nutritional tests, there's a huge difference. So to nature, to mother nature, to the bugs out there whose role it is, they were created to clean up and to decompose things. They simply think, oh, well, this plant's already dead. I'm just gonna eat it. And that's what they do. So this garden has cabbage loopers. It has um, the imported cabbage moth. It has aphids. It has earwigs. It has a bunch of things that people hate in their gardens. But I have almost zero damage right now. I've been harvesting a lot right now in my garden. Of course, this picture was taken last year, but it looks a lot like this because this was last spring. Um, so this is just about one year ago when this picture was taken. And the greenhouse looks just about like this now. And we are, you know, we're harvesting a lot of things. And I have not thrown away one thing yet this year because of uh, pest damage. So that is really, really exciting. Uh, especially when you realize that I went out here with my penetrometer, it's only been two months ago, and I was sticking my penetrometer in this garden. I probably stuck it in in about 30, place, 30 places in here. And it was reading 150 pounds at about three inches deep in most of this greenhouse. And that is a bad thing. Usually, if you like at 150 pounds, most roots won't go through. At 300, no roots go through that hard pan. So this is a greenhouse that has a really serious hard pan. But because I'm managing it for soil function, even though the soil is not functioning the way it should be, then it's still producing excellent disease resistance, excellent pest resistance, and the flavors on these vegetables are excellent. I've had a lot of people come through here in the last 15 to 18 months, and, they, and I offer them to eat. Anytime somebody comes to my greenhouse, I say, okay, start eating stuff, everything's edible just start tasting things. A lot of people say, yeah, I don't like this. I don't like that. One person said to me, yeah, I don't eat celery because it's just water and string. There's nothing in it. And then finally, when I get some of these naysayers to eat something, they are surprised. Not that they like it because if you don't like vegetables, you usually don't like them. But usually there's a reason you don't like the vegetable and it's because of the way it tastes. And so the people who have come in complaining that they don't like stuff, they taste it and they are shocked because it has a different flavor than they thought that vegetable tasted like. So crop rotation happens when you're growing the plant. So let's just say that you were diagnosed with a disease, you only have six months to live, your last hope in life was to grow a beautiful garden people would say well i can never do that because it would take me 10 years to grow go through all the rotations i wanted to go through that is false you can do it in one growing season just mix up all your plants i want to show you something on my screen i think i don't know how to do this i'm going to stop my screen share real quick and then i'm gonna um I don't know what I'm doing. I should take a class on computers. Ezekiel, you should help me. I want to show everybody my camera. How do I make my camera full screen? I have the coolest thing to show you. If you're just trying to show them uh, out of your camera right now, it'll do it because you turned off screen sharing. OK, so everybody can see my camera. Oh, I don't know what I did. Theoretically, yes. We can currently see from the middle of your chest to just above your eyebrows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to move this camera. Okay, tell me what you see right now. Because I can't even see it on my screen. We what? see a big box of beans. So it's in focus. You can see this. Yes. 
Is that better to hold it like that? Not by much. Okay. So just tell me where you can see it good. You can see that? Yeah. I'm afraid I'm wiggling it though. Anyway, you get the picture. So this is a vegetable seed mix. Everything in there is edible. There's black beans, there's pinto beans, there are um, green beans, like Oregon Blue Lake green beans. There's garbanzos, which are the same thing as chickpeas. There's like 10 different kinds of squashes. There's melons, there's mung beans, and then there's wheat, oats, barley, rye, triticale. There are, I'm just looking in there, making it up as I see it. Um, maybe that's all I can see. And then there's a whole bunch of little ones that are so little you can't even see them. So there's the tiny ones. Can you still see that, Ezekiel? Yes, there's, we can. Okay, good. So there's the tiny ones. There's beets, chard, radish. Um, there's some I don't even know what they are because they all look the same, but there's brassicas in there. There's probably like, uh, like must different kinds of mustards and lettuces, chicory. Ooh, there's a parsnip. Um, look at that big watermelon seed right by my, my, my thumb. I just knocked it off. Anyway, it's awesome. Okay, here we go. Let me let me come back to the come back to life here. So I'm super excited because. Um, this is just, this is like every seed that I could think of. And we got all these seeds and we just mixed up a five gallon bucket. And then we go out to a field and we get in this field situation and we plant it. And so we would plant like, yeah, I don't know, five pounds to the acre or whatever of this. And then it would all, um, it would all get super excited and it would grow and it would be a jungle. It would be a giant mess. And then you just reap the abundance. Now, is that reality? In some places, that's a reality. If you're living in the, like one of the deserts of the US, it may not work that well, which is where I live. I live in the Great Basin Desert. If you're in the Great Basin <laughs> Desert, the Mojave Desert, I know there's people who get on this class, at least watch the, the weekly uh, recordings who are in St. George. That's right on the border of the Mojave Desert and the Great Basin Desert. So you have a little bit different climate. You have a unique climate right there in the Hurricane St. George area. And then if you're in the, the Sonoran Desert or the Chihuahuan Desert, which is further south into Arizona and uh, New Mexico and, uh, and Mexico, then we have different situations. So a mix like this may not work as well, but there are mixes that would work. But if you're in the Midwest, if you live in Iowa and Missouri, if you're in New York, anywhere, let's just cut the continent in half with the Missouri River or even the, the Mississippi River, anywhere in that region, from there east, anything east of those rivers that divide the continent, you could do a mix like this and it would thrive. It would be beautiful. And you have 20 or 30 plant families that you're growing in this and probably 75 to 100 species, which would be great. Why do that? Because that's what crop rotation of the future is. So forget worrying about, oh, what did I grow there last year? Can I grow it there this year? Just focus on soil health. By focusing on soil health, you're going to have a garden that starts producing really well way before your soil is as healthy as it could be. Because I should be able to take my penetrometer out there in the garden and stick it in the soil and it just goes in three feet, just like, like putting it in a cake. That's how a functioning soil should feel. But like I just told you, I take it to my greenhouse and I can't get it in three inches before we're hitting 150 pounds, which is really compacted, yet I'm still growing really good crops. So don't get discouraged. Somebody at boot camp made a joke a couple of weeks ago. They came to my boot camp class and they made a joke and they said, well, we could grow good food too if we had soils like yours. And I said, really? And I, I showed them what was happening with the penetrometer. 
And I said, my soil is not good, but I'm doing the right things. You don't have to wait five years or eight years to get your soil perfect. You can grow good food almost immediately with about one year's worth of work. You can get to where you're growing awesome, awesome food. Stop doing the bad things. Start doing the right things. And you can grow great food. Okay, let's look at a picture. Here's a picture right here. We created this garden in boot camp. This was, uh, this was not this year. This was the year before in 2021. So here's boot camp. It's funny. Some, some people on here tonight may have been here. Um, so we built this and we just put cardboard on the ground. We covered it with the compost. It took us 30 minutes to get it done. And then we just put transplants in the ground. And then here's what it looked like. That's what it looked like um, 90 days later, just behind me there. And I pulled maybe 10 or 15 weeds. I don't know. I pulled a handful of weeds out of here, but it was not a big weed problem. Well, a lot of this lawn is quack grass. And so this spring, the quack grass um, sent its rhizomes through it and it came up. And so it kind of made a mess, but um, we're replanting it now and getting the quack grass under control. But this was beautiful. We had broccoli, cauliflower, all kinds of things in there. And if you look right down here in this corner where my cursor is, you see this plant right here? So there's, there's two plants here and they look similar. One is a clover and you can see that red clover blossom right there where my pointer is, right there. And then if you look over here, you can see the little purple flowers right there. And this is alfalfa. And so is that good or bad? I planted those in my garden on purpose because I wanted new different plant families and those are good plants to be growing but I don't let them get out of hand. I cut them off and let them regrow. I let them grow back. So we had about seven plant families in this garden last year. We had peas and spinach and lettuce and all the big brassicas that are obvious that you can see here. And we had um, alfalfa and we had uh, we had herbs. I had three or four culinary herbs scattered throughout here. We had some uh, bergamot and um, sage, thyme, and then we had uh, green onions in here. So we had we had some good plant families in that garden. So that was pretty great. Okay, so let's see. I had a couple other pictures. So if you look at this picture here, let's look at this one where the beets are. So there's the beets. And then you can see the lettuce and you can see the garlic. The garlic looks like the blades of grass. So all of these plants, the beets and lettuce and garlic are un unrelated far back enough that they are in the family. They are, they are different families. And then if you look around, there's weeds. Here's a weed here. Here's a weed here. That's probably an alfalfa. And there's a little blade of grass weed there. And so as weeds grow, there's another weed over here. As weeds grow, I try to keep them manageable to have other plant families in here. Um, again, this picture was taken last year. This year, I have been more diligent in having more plant families planted on purpose. Um, so this is how I do crop rotation. I rotate my roots meaning that I will have tap roots and fibrous roots growing together. And I make sure that I have different plant families growing together. So these beets are getting big. So I'm gonna harvest these beets. What am I gonna do the day I harvest those beets? Well, if I had a tray of cilantro that was ready to transplant, I harvest these beets, I take them away. I bring the tray of cilantro in 15 minutes later after I've taken care of the beet harvest and I put the cilantro in and I dibble a hole every six inches and I put the little cilantros in there. Are they going to grow? Yes, there's not a great big giant plant here shading them. So they have plenty of space to grow. Is it a different plant family than what else is growing here? Yes, it is. So would I want to bring lettuce in and put it here? Probably not because I already have lettuce growing right there. 
So if I plant lettuce here, it would be okay, but I don't have a fourth plant family. So always think different plant family. Hopefully this has helped to make some complex ideas about gardening more simple for you. The entire idea of growing food should be fun. It should be therapeutic. It should be healing. And it should be a lot less work than our forefathers put into it. Because nowadays we can use technology, we can use tools, and we have more information now about what's happening with the soil, with climates, with ver you know the new varieties we have, the old varieties, and how it all mingles together. So hopefully this has made a complex idea simpler. Let's open this up for questions and answers. And let me see if I just had, had any more pictures that I absolutely had to talk about. Okay, I don't, that's all I had for tonight. All right, I'm gonna go up to the slide that shows my classes in case somebody wants to get a hold of me. There's my, there's my, uh, yeah, there's my phone number and my email if you need to get a hold of me. So I'll just leave this up here. Ezekiel, talk to me about uh, about questions for this week. And if for those of you who want to say something, you are certainly welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question. That would be totally fine. Or you can type it into the chat and Ezekiel will read it to me. If you'd like to discuss something, unmute and let's have a conversation for a little while. Okay, Zeke, take it away. All right, the first question is, in planting a complex garden, some plants don't like each other, like cabbage and tomatoes in companion planting. Shouldn't we be concerned a bit about companions? I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, okay, so I, as a teenager and a young adult till I was 30 years old, I read every gardening book I could get my hands on and I believed all that stuff that you just said, like there are certain plants that don't like each other. I have started growing plants that are supposed to hate each other. I have stuff in my greenhouse that is supposed to not, let me say it differently. I have stuff in my greenhouse that is not supposed to like each other. In other words, it's supposed to hate each other according to all the old tales, according to all the old, old ideas. They're thriving, they're growing just fine. So it's hard to know what's true and what's false. I am not calling any of these wonderful authors who have created the good books over the years. I'm not saying they're liars. I'm not saying they were wrong. But I am saying that the way that I'm managing, which is exactly what I have taught you, I'm not worrying about that stuff anymore. And so I think, I mean, I don't know because we're still in the early stages of figuring all this out. But I believe that what's happening with plants that don't like each other is that there's simply different successions happening. Um, if you're, I don't know if you saw the, I gave a, a speech on here. It's in my recording if you weren't on live. A while back, it was about ecological succession. So different plants grow at different times. So cabbages are early succession. So they want a bacterial dominant soil. Tomatoes are uh, late succession because they're a jungle vine. They grow in the jungles and, and like in the forests. And so what they want is a high, not high bacteria, but high fungal activity. So, that is, so let me just say that again for clarification. Cabbage wants lots of bacteria, small amount of fungus. Tomatoes want a large amount of fungus, a small amount of bacteria. So your fungal to bacterial ratio is different. And so I thought, okay, so I'm gonna need to have one bed in my garden that's for all the brassicas, and that's just where I'll grow brassicas. And that'll be great because we don't have to do crop rotation anymore. And then I was thinking, okay, and so for all these other things, I'm gonna have to have more fungal, and then I'm gonna have to manage it somehow so that I don't get too much fungus on the brassicas. And so I was getting all complicated in my mind, but I'm not even sure that's true because what I'm actually observing in my greenhouse is that I have late succession plants that are doing just fine right next to the early succession plants. 
So let's talk in a couple of years when we learn more. Um, you know, start doing your own experiments in your own greenhouses. Um, so I don't have a good answer for you, but what I do know, you you get that detritus sphere that we've talked about on top of the soil. And just for to remind you, the detritus sphere is the four to six inches of compost on top of that soil, and you're planting in those in that, or it could even be wood chips or whatever. And and you get that on there, and you're planting your transplants down in there and things are just growing a lot better so uh, I, I wish i had a better answer if you're cultivating your garden and you have your your cabbages over there and your tomatoes over there and you're keeping it completely weed free you're going to have more struggles than if you grow a jungle grow a jungle grow a jungle grow a jungle um i knew a guy and he told he was adamant he said never plant your um sage around any of your other plants it will kill your other plants i've had sage mingling with plants for years so when i heard him say that i didn't know what he was talking about i knew what he was saying was wrong because i've done it that way forever and then i heard a lot of other people agreeing with what he said and so i just figured well there's a lot i don't know but what i do know is that i've grown sage around all kinds of plants and it's been just fine but I have always gardened with lots of microbes in the soil. So the microbes are the key. It's not the plants that are growing together. Next question. Next question. Do you have any more suggestions about mixing it up in our gardens? <laughs> uh, yeah, get all of your seeds together. And whatever you want to plant, of course, you know, it's almost June. So a lot of people have already planted your gardens. But if you want to plant 10 different things, so you have 10 seed packets, don't even read the packets, rip them all open, put them in a can, you know, just get a tin can. Those are seeds in my tin can that you hear rattling. Mix them all up in the tin can and then just go put them out there and plant them all at the same depth. Don't worry about depths. Everybody's worried about, oh, how deep should I plant this? Pound everything a quarter of an inch deep and keep it wet. Yeah, just mix it up and see what happens. I think if we were being a little bit more brave in our gardening, we would be learning a lot more. But I, I don't know. I just noticed over the years, people are so scared to plant something for fear they're going to kill it that they don't ever have anything alive. Let's, let's, get, let's just go crazy. Let's just plant a bunch of stuff and... I mean, all plants want water, so keep your irrigation system going. All plants need some compost on, um, to mulch around them. So put a couple of inches, three to six inches of compost out there. Put your plants out there and go to town. That's my suggestion. Break the rules. If there's a gardening rule, break it, unless it kills the plant. Okay, next question. Do you have any suggestions on where to find lists of plant families? Um, yeah, just go to Google. And the real answer is no, I don't. But here's what I would do. Go to Google and just type in list of plant families or vegetable, vegetable crops by plant family. It's just, it's taxonomy. So if you go on a university website, you could probably find worksheets that professors are handing out to their students. Um, to because when you're going through a botany program, you're going to have to memorize the different species and families and blah, blah, blah. And so if you, but it would be a taxonomy. It's just the naming of the plants. So yeah, just do a quick Google search. I mean, I don't have a list, but like the, the list of uh, like peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, Potatoes, they're all the same family. They're nightshades. Um, the brassica family, that's all your cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower. Um, most of your mustards are, are, you know, the Chinese cabbages. Those are all the brassicas. A lot of the radishes would fall into that group. There's a lot of wild weeds that are in that group. Anyway, just Google it. You can find it fast by Googling it. I don't have a good list. Okay, next question. 
Uh, just on that last question, I would mention that Wikipedia has multiple really excellent peer reviewed and professionally edited pages for scientific topics like that, that I would highly recommend perusing. I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is, I have about 10 starts or more of heritage to made Thomas Jefferson 1827 tomatoes. I don't want it to cross pollinate with my three other tomatoes. Where should I plant them? Or where should I plant the other three? I do want to mix the heritage tomatoes up my like in my garden like you teach us. Um, let me uh, let me think about that for just a second. Heritage tomatoes is that in the chat here? Oh, I found it. Just wanted to look at it and refer to what you said exactly. Um, I would just plant them if you hopefully you have a garden on one side of the house and then you have a garden on the other side. Um, if bees are working your plants, they usually work plants that are pretty close together. Um, if you have if you can do it across town, that's better. If you're in a city environment and everybody's growing tomatoes, it can be a problem. Uh, you could put them in a greenhouse with a screen so that the um, so no pollinators can get in and then you can pollinate them yourself. You'd have to go in there once a day and you just wiggle the, the plants. Um, wind will pollinate tomatoes. You know, you don't really need pollinators to pollinate tomatoes. If you have wind, it will, they will pollinate. So, you know, but shaking the tomatoes two or three times a day will do it. You can also um, pollinate it with a paintbrush, but that's too tedious um so those are ideas but i think if you if they were planted 100 feet away you're probably not going to cross pollinate so on two sides of a yard they probably won't unless you have very very active bees but you bees are usually going to fill up with pollen in a very small area they're not going to fly from this flower and then go 100 feet to get pollen from another they want to work the flowers that are really close together so yeah did that answer your question? Hopefully that did. Obviously the ones that you do want to cross pollinate, just, just plant them every other plant, just mix up your garden. Because then as the wind moves the pollen around, then the pollen's gonna be hitting plant to plant. So that's what yeah. you're Yeah, um, William, those uh, plants, we have a, um, a terrace that's about 48 feet wide and we're gonna plant our garden there and we haven't had good weather it's crazy next week it's going to get down to 36 again yeah. at night and yeah, 55 well, during yeah. the day yeah welcome to climate like, change climate change yeah, is like real. You. <laughs> yeah and, and we don't have a greenhouse and so um i was a little concerned about where to put those other three tomatoes that i did get yeah i picked them up at costco right um yeah but but these from starts, I don't want to cross pollinate. I want to keep it true. Sure. And so that I'll have seeds to share with you <laughs> if you Thank want. Thank you. I love that. Um, yeah. So um, I they are 1827 tomato. They were taken to Europe and they use them in Europe. And that's where I saw it. And I brought it back here. Good. And uh, they grew really well in Missouri. And this is my first year here in Santa yeah. Quint. And so um, I guess I should put them maybe on the south side of the house against the house, the other three, um, you know, just kind of by themselves. Yeah, yeah. And then intermix my heritage tomatoes with the rest of the garden that we're doing. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Zeke, what's next? Next question. Did you make that mix of seeds yourself or buy it? How would you get that many seeds under the dirt or just sprinkle it in on top and then roll it over when the season is done? Um, so yes to all of those, except uh, we bought this bucket of mixed up seed. They came from, um, what is that guy's name? He's from Nebraska. He supplies most of North America with all its cover crop seed. Oh, he's the greatest guy. Yeah, everybody ought to watch his YouTube videos. Oh, what is his name? Car Carbonomics. 
So it, he has a play on words. So we all need carbon in the soil to, because that creates fertilizer. And so instead of talking about farm economics, he talks about carbonomics. I think if you YouTube carbonomics, like his videos would start coming up. What the heck is his name? I should look him up real quick. But that's where we got this seed from. Um, I didn't order it. Jared ordered it, who is here on the ranch. Um, we do the ranch and thing here together. But that wasn't very helpful, was it? But yeah, just plant them. Just if you have a little seed planter, plant them. Dibble a hole in the ground with a pointed stick, drop five seeds in, don't care what kind they are. You know, a turnip and a squash and a, and a, a tomato and a rutabaga, they'll all grow out of the same hole if it has water. It sounds crazy, but that's what we need to do. We need to get crazy. Doing things really nice and neat with agriculture for the last 70 years has created food shortages. It's created malnutrition in our grocery stores. It's created all kinds of problems. Let's start breaking the rules and do it different. So yeah, let's do the next question, Zeke. The next question. Do you have a recipe for the veggie mix for the desert climate of Northern Utah? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, but if you like to eat it, then what I want you to do is just go throw all the seeds out there and see which ones grow in, grow in the desert of Northern Utah. And then let us all know which ones grew and which ones didn't. That's what we need to start doing. We need thousands of people doing that. And in five years, we would have a lot of data. All right, the next question is about plant families again, and you might have already gone over it, but I'm going to read it anyway. Um, I understand root families like carrots and fibrous plants like lettuce, but I don't understand what the other two or four families are. You said you had seven families. Okay, good, good clarification. So what happens when you have a, a minimum of four plant families is the microbes in the soil do a thing called, um, what's it called? It's called quorum sensing. And it's, they, they turn on in the plant. So it's, it's the, the microbes make something happen in the plant. And what the microbes do is called quorum sensing. But what happens in the plant is called a secondary metabolite. So the, the quorum sensing turns on secondary metabolites in the plant, which creates disease resistance, pest resistance, um, the ability to absorb nutrients, the ability to get bigger than expected, um, colors are enhanced and more beautiful, um, flavors are enhanced and more beautiful, there's more sugars, more proteins in the foods. Now, but if you only have three plant families of roots mingling together, the microbes do not do quorum sensing. Now, this may not be true, but this is what the latest science is showing us. In 10 years, we will know more, and then I'll be preaching something new. But that's what we think is true today. So this is a scientific theory, and I've proven it in my garden because we have all these pests that live there, and none of my plants are being destroyed from any of them because I have at least four. But if you have six or eight or 24 plant families, then, they, then it's even better. The more plant families you have, the more diversity of microbes you have, the stronger the quorum sensing is, and the more secondary metabolites can be turned on in plants. I know that that was a huge mouthful, but that's the answer, and I tried to tell you the why. So let's move to the next question. Next question. Sage is a perennial like oregano. Where do you plant it? Um, so I like to put sage in just random places around the garden. And I can put perennials anywhere in my garden because I don't till my garden. I don't have monocrops. So throughout my entire vegetable garden, I could have a sage every 10 feet if I wanted it. 
I could have any perennial plant anywhere I wanted it because nothing ever gets tilled up. And if I had a bunch of tomatoes and peppers and onions and garlic and strawberries and all of these things with a few perennials here and there, when the plants, their annuals come out, like a lettuce plant in the summer is only going to be there for 30 or 40 days and, and we grow it and then it comes out. As soon as one plant comes out, we put another plant in. So that's how I manage my garden is one plant at a time. It's not a row at a time. It's not a bed at a time. It's not a greenhouse at a time. It is not a field at a time or an acre at a time. It is one plant at a time. In the fall, when my tomatoes stop producing, one plant will, st will start to, well, like I'll pick all the tomatoes, but the plants, the tomato plants next to those ones will be, uh, they'll still be producing, but I will take out the plant that stopped producing. And now I have an area in the garden, I have two or three square feet where I can put something in to grow over the winter. I could put in three or four small kale plants. I could put in something else. Um, so yeah, so having perennials in right in your vegetable garden is not a problem, especially uh, when you have um, like a greenhouse. If you have a protected area and you're growing and harvesting 365 days a year, then it's pretty awesome because you're just, you're harvesting and planting, harvesting and planting all the time. So in order to do that, I always have a tray of transplants ready to go, ready to be planted in. Okay, next question. All right, next question. What about thinning your seed mix up? I wouldn't know what each tiny start is and how far apart each plant needs. Have you yeah. actually planted that seed mix up yet? Okay, so did this say, what about thinning? Is that what the first question was? Oh yeah, I found it in the chat. Yeah, what about thinning? Okay, here's the deal. I don't thin anything ever. I never thin. Thinning is a thing of the past. I don't think I've thinned anything since I was a teenager. It made me angry. You would buy carrot seeds and a package of carrot seeds that only have 200 seeds in it. And I wanted to grow 200 carrots, not five or seven. And the package said, put your carrot seeds in and it tells you how to plant them. And then it said, once they come up, thin them to two or three inches apart so you get a big carrot. I thought that's the stupidest thing in the world. That somebody's just trying to sell me more carrot seed. So I would painstakingly put a carrot seed every two or three inches. And sometimes a seed wouldn't come up. So we, you, they would be spaced a little bit further than that, which I guess could frustrate somebody, but thinning has been i haven't thinned forever i never 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 thin thinning is a waste of time it's a waste of space it's a waste of seed so just plant your seeds in the first place with the correct number of seeds so when we plant this like this is a whole five gallon bucket but i think when jared got it he had a couple of 50 pound bags which is like two or three five gallon buckets and he just dumped it in his no-till drill and he just drilled it out across that acre of land and then up came all the stuff, you know? And so that's the way that uh, this is meant to be planted is with a tractor and acres and acres. So you would set your um, cedar on the tractor to plant it very thinly so that stuff is not too crowded. But in your own home gardening, so for a home gardening context, just dibble a little hole in the ground and just put a pinch of this in there. And so if you have a, a, a like one seed and it looks like a pumpkin or a squash because those all look kind of similar. You might just put one of those in the hole and then make your next hole like two or three feet away. And then if you get a pinch that has three or four tiny seeds, go ahead and put three or four of them in there. Um, but don't put 10 or 20 seeds in, just two, like anywhere from, you know, two to eight tiny seeds one green bean seed and a couple of tiny seeds. So it's just pinches. You're just putting in pinches. Um, you know, I think everybody in the United States knows what a pumpkin seed is or looks like. 
because it, you, there's a thing called Halloween and people have carved pumpkins. Even if you've never done that, you've seen someone do it. So you have seen a pumpkin seed. And so we all kind of know what those look like. And pumpkins, squashes, all of those, they all look similar. So it doesn't matter if it's a winter squash or a summer squash or a pumpkin, they all look very similar. Therefore, uh, the spacing is about the same. You're going to be planting them three or four or five feet apart. And the tiny seeds, you can put those um, six, seven, eight inches apart. Okay, next question. All right, next question. My dad seeded in a row, then thinned. Would you do that or plant single seeds or something else? You kind of already answered that, but if you want to expound on it. Yeah, that, I think I just ranted and raved about that enough. Okay. Um, hold on, Zeke, hold on a minute. The end of that other question though, have you actually planted that seed mix up yet? I have not planted up this seed mix, but I've seen people who have, and it's really fun to see what happens. The whole idea of this is to not have a vegetable garden. I need to clarify this. The idea of this is a cover crop. So you have a piece of land, you need to grow something on it for soil health. Why are we only planting things that are normally in a pasture? Why couldn't we plant vegetables? And that was a valid argument. And so these fun people at this seed company started putting this mix together. And they actually said, we will give you a bag of seed for free if you will plant up, you know, however much, half an acre, 10 acres, whatever the farmer was going to plant. Plant it up and then whatever you harvest from that field, give it away to the poor and the hungry and to food shelters. And people were like, yeah, that's cool. And so I, I don't know if they're still doing the free seed program this year, but I think they were as, like as recent as last year. So it was pretty awesome. But yeah, I'm gonna plant this this year and it'll, it'll be cool. Okay, Zeke, go ahead. All right. How does square foot gardening fit in with your seed and plant mix up? Okay, so if you're doing a square foot garden, instead of having one so square foot gardening is based on a four foot by four foot square and then you have a line coming this way and that way so you have your you have your um your 16 feet in that four foot by four foot and then in each one like i think you can fit like one cabbage or one head lettuce or four romaines or whatever how, however the square foot thing works out like 16 onions and so it's really fun how that works just mix it up you would never 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 have your four foot square be one crop that would not work so it, but you have 16 square feet in that four by that four by four okay And so what you're going to do in that four by four is put 16 different crops in there. And by doing that, there's a really good chance you would get four plant families in there. I mean, it'd be simple to do. Lettuce is one plant family. Spinach would be another one. Onions is a different one. Um, you could put a culinary herb right in the middle, like, you know, oregano, chives. Well, chives is the same as onion. but um, um sage so that would be a different one and the roots would spread out and would mingle with most of those other crops um, so that could be a fun thing um, you could put uh you could put grass in there you know what are grasses that would grow that are edible corn is a grass you know so you could put you know you could just get excited and fun whatever you want to eat figure out what plant families they're coming from and don't be afraid of weeds let a few weeds grow Put an alfalfa plant on all four corners and right in the middle of your square foot garden. Of course, an alfalfa, it's a legume. So if you're growing beans and peas, then you've already got that uh, plant family covered because they're legumes, that's their plant family. Okay, next question. All right, next up, Leslie, did you have something to say? I do. I'm, I'm, uh, I guess I'm not great at typing. Um, 
thanks for all this information, William. It's 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 so good. You're welcome. Uh, I'm having fun. This is good. This is good, isn't it? Okay, so I'm having like crazy envisioning as you're talking about this stuff. Um, That's good. That means we're doing something <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and I'm looking, you know, like how what are your rows like you showed us the picture of the outside that you put it on grass yeah. what are your rows like in the greenhouses because you know if we're just planting like crazy I'm trying to figure out how to get in there and harvest without stepping on everything and I so I'm trying to get a better picture of how to do that I, I in my greenhouse I don't have rows what do you have how does it work what is it I like just, it's a jungle Ezekiel, what's it like? Ezekiel was here two days ago, or three days, whatever. He was here for a week. I don't know. It's a jungle. If it's have not a been jungle, in the forest, have you ever been in the forest and you can kind of see game trails through the underbrush? That's yeah. kind of what it's like. <laughs> well, that's 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 accurate. It's wild. It's crazy. Um, Okay, so my greenhouse is 120, 130 feet long, if, depending on whether you count the rock wall, because it's thick. And so I have one trail that's going straight down, and then it goes across the back, and then it comes straight up the other side. So we can do a great big rectangle loop in there. And then, I mean, I, I'm growing 100 tomato plants in there. And I want to be able to string them up on a fence. So I do have two rows of tomatoes. But between the tomatoes, I have lettuce and garlic and spinach and onions. I don't even know what all. It's just a jungle. It's a mess. People come in there and they go, oh, this is a mess. It scares them to death. If you are an OCD, OCD gardener, is that a thing? Did I say that right? If you're an OCD, I shouldn't make fun of that. It's a serious condition for people. I have it. But if, if I don't have, the, I have the opposite of it. Uh, my life is a disaster. And so it works so good to do this. The thing is, I want to make my bro kind of serpentine, you know, but I just can't because I need to have straight fences because I need something for cucumbers to grow up. I need a place for, because I, I grow cucumbers vertically. So I put up bean poles and then the cucumbers go up them. The tomatoes go up a thing like that. Um, beans go up that. Um, I even uh, um, have my peppers trellised like that because when they get top heavy, um, I don't like them falling over. So I trellis them. I don't know. It's, I don't know. Helena, you were here last year. If you want to, you could help Leslie tell, tell Leslie what my greenhouse looks like. Um, it's a mess, Leslie. Except it grows amazing food. Helena, if you want to, um, you go ahead. If not, don't, and it's fine. Will you take pictures of your greenhouse and show us next week? I mean, playing? yeah, I can. I mean, I don't, I can't commit to that, but I mean, yeah, <laughs> I maybe. should. Parker's thinking of coming down. So maybe he send can. him, send him. So if I have any pull, I will. I, it's just a matter if he can, not that he wouldn't want to. Okay. I, can I do another question? Yeah, please. Okay. So you're talking about planting like the, uh, several different seeds in one hole yeah um that seems crazy too but it would be a very interesting experiment anyway how far apart are you putting these holes because you don't know what you're gonna i mean yeah i don't even know what these are so there's a lot of brassicas in here in this mix and brassicas seeds all look the same <laughs> because they're the same species Mm -hmm. The way that a scientist identifies a species is by the way the flower looks and the seed looks. And, and so like a broccoli and a cauliflower and a, and a cabbage and kale, when you grow it in your garden, they look very different, but they're the same thing. They're just di very, they're just different breeds. Like in the animal world, we call them breeds. In the, in the plant world, we call them, uh, we would call them varieties or cultivars. So they're, but they're the same species, which is crazy to think about. 
Um, now, mustards are the same family, but there are different species. Uh, but anyway, so, I mean, how far apart do you put them? If it looks like a little tiny brassica seed, those need about, a, a, you know, one to two square feet to grow. So, I mean, if, if, you're tr if, you, if you need to have a really nice garden, don't mix up your seeds and do this. But if you want to grow a jungle of edibles, this is what you do. And don't care about how far apart they are. Okay. Just put all, just make a grid work just to satisfy math. That's all we're gonna do. We're gonna satisfy mathematics right now. So go out into your garden and make a, make a hole in the, just dibble a hole every one foot, one foot centers. And then you just put like five or six seeds in every hole and you cover the holes and just like half an inch deep or, or a quarter of an inch deep, whatever. And then just keep it watered until it all comes up and you will grow a jungle. That's what you want to do is grow a jungle. Okay. That's so funny. Um, so if you're saying you've, you've got two plants side by side, one's healthy, one's not, the bugs are always going to go for the, the unhealthy one? I mean, that's what the science has shown. Yeah, okay. that's, that's just what it shows because we've been <laughs> doing side by side tests and, and that's what it shows. Yeah. OK. All right. Thank you. You bet. Um, so one more one more thing about that, Leslie, mm. the, the, the side by side tests that we've been doing, it's it becomes an indicator of what your soil is doing. That's why you would do this. So if one plant is showing insect damage, then we would hurry and do a, a test on it, a tissue test of a plant that's close by, that's not being attacked. And the other plant that looks about the same, but it's being attacked. And those ones that are being attacked have less sugars, less proteins, less other mm -hmm. nutritional value. And then we would go into the soil underneath that plant in the root zone of those plants. And so let's say these plants are two feet apart. So we would pull a, a, a soil sample right at the base of each plant. And then we look at it under the microscope and we are seeing differences in what's actually happening in the soil. There's not as many microbes in the unhealthy plant, okay. in, in the soil of where the unhealthy plant is growing. Okay. So, Question. Yeah, yeah, you can ask another question. <clears throat> okay, so you were talking about um, uh, planting like the four different families, and then you said you pull, would pull up the beets and plant in the cilantro. So, yeah. Yeah. are are tap root vegetables going to be mingling with the other roots? You know, you're trying, you're talking about having them all mingle together, even though they more straight down. Yes. Um, yeah. So taproot plants, they have a taproot that goes straight down, but they still have feeder roots that go out within the first, um, you know, six okay. inches of soil. And mm -hmm. they're going very horizontal. And that's where a lot of their feeder roots are doing. Okay. Um, if, if you're able, if you're ever able to like dig up a carrot um, or a parsnip without disturbing the soil, and then you were able to like very carefully wash that soil away without breaking those roots. And these roots are almost microscopic. It would look like a carrot and it would have like three and four and five inch roots coming out of the carrot that were very fine, finer than human hair. Okay. Uh, so almost like spider webs, except bigger than spider webs. So, so anyway. But they, but you would see a, a, a mass of those. So yes, the tap roots and the fibrous roots, they do, they both have feeder roots that do mingle together if planted in the same vicinity. And then they just, when you're pulling it up, they stay in the ground. That, yeah, so, so like a, a carrot, yeah. when you pull them out, all those little roots break off. And so <laughs> we, we don't even know they're there unless you do really close observation like with a magnifying glass or something. Okay.
Sure. All right. Appreciate you. Okay, Ezekiel, what's next? All right, next. Um, Melanie says you're cutting out and she couldn't hear about the sage and oregano. Melanie, uh, he's recording on his end. So the video recording on YouTube will have uh, perfect quality. Um, the next question is, where do you plant strawberries? Okay, so I have one entire bed devoted just to strawberries and I've done that out of convenience because I wanted a lot of strawberries. So I have a 120 foot bed that's three feet wide and it is growing uh, a lot of weeds right now, but I do keep them managed. So when you look at it from a distance, you don't see weeds. And I have garlic in there um, that is growing as well. And I, when the garlic comes out, I'll probably replant it to the garlic again because we're, we harvest the garlic in June, July, and then we're planting the garlic again in like September. So it's only a couple of months when that plant won't be in there. Um, I'm not planning on putting another crop in there. And so if I really do need and want the four um, species mingling, I mean plant families mingling roots, then I would focus on um, just weeds to do that. I would let a few weeds grow. Um, so that's how I am handling um, the strawberries right now. I also have quite a few strawberries that are growing in the um, in the rock wall, my big stone wall. I've just dibbled holes in the native soil that's between the stones, and I've stuck strawberries in there um, this winter. So yeah. So that's how I'm doing strawberries. We do need to remember though that strawberries are a late succession plant because where do you find them in nature? We find them in forests, which tells us they're a late succession plant, which also tells us they want lots of fungus, which means if you are mulching your strawberries with wood chips, your strawberries will be happier than if you don't. So why wood chips? Because wood chips are fungus food. Okay, next Ezekiel. Andy. Okay, maybe, maybe Ezekiel got cut off of this call. Maybe I'm cut off and nobody can hear me. Let me see where we're at here. We can hear you. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Do I grow flowers in my vegetable garden? Yes, I do. I grow um, flowers a lot. I love flowers. And it's very wonderful to have the option to grow flowers because there are dozens of plant families that you can grow as a flower. So that's pretty awesome. Um, sometimes in my, um, in my vegetable gardens where I need to manage a certain crop so I know how many I'm harvesting, let's say I have an order for 100 romaine lettuce heads. So if I had an order for 100, I would plant um, 200 seeds. I would transplant um, 150 um, transplants that would be in there. And then um, I would end up with my 100 nice quality plants that could go um, to market. So by being able to um, just manage it that way, I would put them in a row. They would be one long straight row so that I could see them every day. I could take good care of them. I could, if there was a problem, maybe I could do something. Um, there has to be a way to understand and um, like make sense if we're actually gonna make a living farming. Um, we can't just go out in the jungle and try to um, wildcraft foods if we have people counting on us to feed them. So with a, a monocrop system of a bunch of romaine lettuce, I would love to use flowers. That's where this whole thing is going. Um, I would love to use flowers between the rows of lettuce or tomatoes or whatever my monocrop might be. So in the furrow between the rows, 
I would just put all kinds of flowers. That would be a wonderful and an easy way to get my minimum of four plant families mingling roots. So absolutely, yes, I grow flowers in my vegetable garden. Okay, pumpkins need lots of room. What about beans that are vining up in the mix? I don't care. That's great. That's just more diversity. You've got to remember that the reason we plant a jungle is to build resilience in the soil. We're growing microbes because of all the different kinds of crops that are growing. We are building soil. We're growing soil. If we were going to grow a cover crop mix like this out of vegetables one year, we're not doing that to grow food, although they are food bearing crops, so we should harvest quite a bit. But the purpose, the number one purpose of planting this diversity is to grow good soil, to build soil. So if we're worried about pumpkins needing lots of room, don't do this. You know, if you're worried about beans that need a pole to vine up, don't do this. The purpose for doing this is different than producing food. But let's do this instead of just growing something we're not going to eat. Because we could do the same thing with the soil with a bunch of things that are not edibles, and then you have nothing to eat. Besides, it's great fun for kids to go out there in the summer and they're just tromping through this whole jungle. And they're like, hey, we found this, we found that. It's, it's just a good family experience while you're building the soil. Um, planting that seed mix sounds exciting. A fun surprise as the seeds come up. Absolutely. When do you plant garlic and harvest it? Plant garlic in September, October. Harvest it in June, July. Uh, it grows all winter long. Uh, when do you plant garlic and harvest it? I just read that. Um, do you have a photo of your string trellis for beans and tomatoes? It sounds like I better go out to the greenhouse and take pictures. For those of you who are on my Patreon account, I release five videos a week of all this stuff. So it's $8 a month. Melanie, I think you guys are on there. I think John signed up. Start watching my videos and you would see all this stuff. There's Thank you. I guess I'll have to steal it from him. <laughs> yeah, well, you can buy it too. I'll, I... <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is it's on his computer now. <laughs> he better share it with me. I'll That's be watching right. them all the time. Thank you. So yeah, anyway, yeah, there's over 300 videos on there. I mean, it's showing all this stuff. So it's great. It was, I, I film, I'm out there filming all the time. I was filming some stuff yesterday. Okay, um, how far apart do you plant the strawberries? Um, about, I say a foot, but it's always a little bit more. So 12 to 16 inches is about how I um, space strawberries. Okay, Leslie, good night. You're probably already gone. Um, Ashley, good night. Thank you, thank you. Can you take a pile of microbial jungle and mix the soil into another square foot garden or garden area? Yes, but it would defeat the purpose because yeah. if, you, if you take if you take one soil and put it somewhere else, you're killing fungus. Fungus does not like to be disturbed. Once you get fungal colonies growing, you don't want to move them. So the best thing to do is to um, grow, you can grow the fungus in a compost and then put the compost in the soil because they're so prevalent that that's a good way to get to initially inoculate soils. But if you don't want to do compost and you're just going to build soil by growing cover crops, grow the cover crop directly right on your, um, just right on the soil that you need to improve. Okay. William, can I ask another question? Please do. Um, you said that the wood chips give you fungal growth. What yes. gives us bacterial growth? All kinds of things give you bacterial growth, but you don't need to worry about it because every soil test I have ever done has too much bacteria. You already have bacteria. If you want bacteria, then get a bunch of green growing plants and go till them into the, your soil. Nothing will stimulate bacteria growth like tilling weeds into the soil. 
We used to grow green manure crops where we would grow a big crop and then till it in. That would make massive amounts of bacteria grow. It, and so what happens when you have massive amounts of bacterial stimulation in the soil, it releases amazing amounts of carbon from the soil into the atmosphere because that is the function of bacteria. They release carbon because if we run out of carbon in the atmosphere, then plants don't have any more carbon to photosynthesize with because they need the CO2 to, to in the, in the uh, gaseous form. And so that's the function of, of the bacteria is to release that. And the way that they're stimulated the most is by tillage. And so my belief, I hate to say this because people think I'm a political nut and I, I just don't want to associate with politics. Um, but the thing is, all of the tillage that we are doing worldwide, and we have been since the invention of the tractor, we've been doing massive tillage. And I think that's what has made the CO2 levels rise so much. Um, you know. There's just some pretty good solid science that there's high levels of higher levels of carbon in the atmosphere now than there ever have been, and the best way to get it there is 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 by tillage, and you can see it. NASA has some pretty cool cameras um, up in space looking at the different. Um, they're looking at the different gases on the Earth, and in North America in the springtime the um, the levels of um, carbon dioxide spike every single springtime when people are tilling. So in the month of April, May, and June, when all the tillage is happening in North America and in Europe and, um, you know, Eastern Europe and, and even into Asia, where all of the major tillage is done, there's not a lot of tillage done in the Southern Hemisphere compared to the Northern. But, and so when we have our springtime, we see spikes in those three months every year of carbon dioxide. Uh, and so, you know, the politicians and, and a lot of the people worried about climate and all that stuff and what are we going to do about it? And there's all these people trying to figure it out. They're always talking about fossil fuels and how fossil fuels are the problem. Uh, but we don't really, I don't know, the math doesn't add up from the things that I've learned. Fossil fuels are about 5% of what's half of the contribution. And the rest of it um, is coming from tillage. So try to tell that to your conservative farming friends, you know. I probably won't have any friends after tonight, but <laughs> but anyway, that's uh that's an interesting thought. But it's easy, it's easy to fix it if we stopped tilling and started growing cover crops, the carbon goes back down in the roots. And then we don't have to buy all the expensive stuff anymore because the carbon is in the soil um, creating the, the natural fertilizers um, for the plants. So it's pretty awesome, you know? I mean, the design is there to work. We just have to work the design. So. Um, another question along those lines, when you plant your clover and your alfalfa in that little corner, yeah. what do you do with it before oh, it goes? Yes. Yeah. So. What, when it blooms, I cut it and I feed it to my cow. I feed it to my chickens. I feed it to my worms. I feed it to my bacteria and my um, protozoa and fungus and nematodes in my compost piles. So it is there to become uh, compost for my garden. Eventually it becomes part of the detritus sphere on top of the garden. So that's, that's why I grow it. Thank All right. You. Okay. Oh, so you cut off the tops and you feed that to your worms? Yep. yep. I just cut the plant. Just like cutting hay. So I just cut it with uh -huh. my pocket knife. Okay. Yes. And then the rest of it you leave in the garden. Yeah. So I don't pull the plant out because it'll okay. grow back again. Yeah, well, like alfalfa will grow back five spread. or six times in a growing season. Will the clover spread? Um, yes, clover has rhizomes in it, so it will spread and become a, a noxious weed. Um, the alfalfa does not have rhizomes, so it will not do that. 
What do you do with your clover then? I just do it the same. Do like you that was pull that it was, out? That no, I cut it and let it grow back. But yeah, it was red okay. clover and it's not invasive like the white clovers. Oh so. use the red clover seeds. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean it will still spread though. If you want something yeah. that will not spread, don't plant any clover. But clover is so good with um, all the minerals and everything in it. That's what they use it for clover crop, cover crop, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but, you, but you'll, it, it, it all comes back to context. You've got to remember one of the main soil health principles is context. If you want to be out there fighting weeds, there's all kinds of great plants that will do amazing things and they will take over your garden. So if you want to garden without fighting weeds, use species that will do very similar things just as well that you won't have to fight, that won't take over. So I don't recommend any of the clover family for people in vegetable gardens. Okay. I have it in my lawn and I wish the whole thing were clover <laughs> in our lawn in Missouri. Yeah, sure, yeah. It could Make just sense. all be clover for, for yeah. all I care. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You okay? Um, if that's all the questions, it looks like that's all the questions in the chat. If I missed your question, you can unmute and we can talk about it. If you have any other questions, we can talk about them. I think our subject for next week is going to be about grain, growing grain. Because Helena, who is on here tonight, asked me on Facebook to talk about grain. So I'm going to write a note right now. Here's my note, and it's going to say how to grow grain. So here it is. I'm going to put this on my computer. It will be here all week. So next Thursday's class, we are going to talk about grain. That will be fun. How do well, I have a, have a question quickly? William, Please I'm one, ask. two, one, two. I'm one, two, one, two. Okay. I'm John <laughs> Fisher. Sorry, I don't know how that got up there. Hey, but um, um, I've just made a salad. And, uh, you know, there's always stuff that I throw away. Could I just throw it in the garden or should I throw it in the compost pile? Either way. I mean, I, mean, I, I can throw my vegetable remains in the garden uh, garden just as well as in the compost and yes then, okay yep both are a benefit you know a lot of times kitchen scraps um can be messy and so it's nice to compost them especially if you had a lot of them for obvious reasons or it would look like a trash pile when you go out to your garden most people want their garden to be aesthetically pleasing those are the only two differences so the kitchen scraps that we have, I do compost them first in a thermophilic compost. And then just means a hot compost that heats up. And then I take my hot compost and I put it in my worm bin and then my worms eat it. Mm -hmm. you, you can take those kitchen scraps and just put them on the worm bin and let the worms eat it. Or you can just take them and put them directly under your growing plants right on your garden. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so that's the end of our uh, class tonight. So thank you for being on here. And I'm going to close this down. We'll, we'll see you next week. Um, invite your friends and family if they need to uh, learn about gardening. Uh, we will be here for quite a bit longer, I hope.